Books with Brandy Wine. Today I wanted to share with you five of my favorite magical swords in fantasy novels. Uh, this is going to be part of a larger series that are including magical items that I love in the books and magic swords that I love in the books. Uh, there are definitely way more than just five swords. So this is like the series is obviously going to take place in multiple videos, but for right now, I'm just going to share with you five different swords slash daggers, because obviously I had to include a beautiful sting here. Uh, this is actually a letter opener that I have that is modeled after sting. And if you don't know what sting is, it is a magical dag, elf, well, elfish, elvish dagger that was first introduced in The Hobbit. Uh, Bilbo Baggins found it, I believe, in a cavern. And he carried it with him throughout his journey, and then he passed it on to Frodo in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, you can see there, Frodo's got it. I'm pretty sure at that point he has Sting. I'm pretty sure it's Sting. Uh, Sting is a dagger, uh, so it's not a full-size sword, but because hobbits are so tiny, uh, he did, both of them, including Samwise Gamgee, so all three of the hobbits, did use it as a sword because it was the right size for them. Uh, this uh, dagger is incredibly sharp. It was made, I believe, in the first realm? First era? First something? Please don't attack me, huge Lord of the Rings fans. Uh, and so it is super, super sharp, and because of when it was made, the blade does turn blue if you are in the presence of an orc or a goblin. Uh, all the swords and daggers that were made in that same era have that ability. And so that is one of the cool things because it does he does use that to his advantage. Sometimes they find out that there are orcs coming because Sting lights up, which is really, really cool. Uh, the next uh, sword that I wanted to talk about is in... Nicholas St. North and the Battle of the Nightmare King. Uh, this is a sword that actually uh, shows up at the very end of the book and on the cover. If you can see it there, that is a sword. It has the moon in the middle. It has a crescent moon on top. It was a sword that belonged to the father of the man on the moon. And it is one of the five pieces of the Moon Clipper, which is like this huge moon spaceship, which is what the moon actually is when it's like spread out in clipper mode. And uh, once it is combined with the other five pieces, it will make a super weapon that will help fight against Pitch, who is the Nightmare King. And uh, apparently it also holds all the secrets of the Moon Clipper. There's not much that we actually know about it in this book. I don't, I assume he uses it in the other books, but it's been so long since I've read them that I don't remember, and I do plan on reading them all soon, so hopefully I'll find out more about that. There are a lot of really, really cool swords in this book, and I plan on talking about some of them in my other videos, but I definitely wanted to focus on that one in this video because it's very different from what you would normally expect a sword to look like. It definitely doesn't look like it would actually work at all like a sword. It looks like it would be more like... Uh, the, I forget what they call them, I guess wands or whatnot, that the Sailor Scouts had. That's really what it looks more like. But they do say it is a sword. Uh, the next sword that I wanted to talk about, actually two swords that are in Dragon's Green. And so sword number four and five, nope, sword number three. I cannot do numbers. Sword number three is the Sword of Orpheneus. And that is a sword that, just like my little sting here, it is the size of a letter opener. And when it is picked up by a true hero, no, a true warrior, it turns into a full-sized, totally epic, totally awesome sword that also activates, like, the warrior-ness inside the person. And so they start to feel, like, really protective and warrior-like and all kinds of awesome stuff. Uh, but it can only be activated by a true warrior. So, like, and here the other kids have to carry the sword because if the one kid that's the true warrior touches it, it automatically gets huge and they don't have the space to be carrying around this huge, awesome sword. And then another sword that is mentioned in this uh, book is actually at the very end of the book. So we don't actually get to see that sword in action, but we do get a really cool description of it. And that is the Sword of Light. And that sword is on a necklace 
and it has a sword, a wide blade sword attached to the necklace and it's all gold. And when Effie touches it and says a magic word, then, and I have to read it because her words are better than mine. It says, bang, there was a crack and hiss in the air. She has touched it and said the magic word already. Uh, it was just like what happened when Wolf touched the sword of Orpheneus. Well, almost. In Wolf's case, something that was small became big. In Effie's case, something that didn't exist in this world suddenly appeared as if it had been beamed down from somewhere full of light, hope, and beauty. In her hands now was a large gleaming sword made from partly of mountain gold and partly from light itself. Holding it, she felt like she could go anywhere and do anything. She felt invincible. So the sword doesn't just expand from the pendant that's on the necklace. A new sword actually appears in her hand. And as she mentioned, that sword is made from mountain gold and light itself, which means that the sword is also super, super lightweight. And when she holds it, she feels invincible. This sword can only be yielded by a true hero. And more specifically, it can only be yielded by Effie. Because now that she has bonded with it, said the magic word, she is now inseparable from that necklace. No one can take that necklace from her unless they kill her. Now, I don't know if the sword can be taken from her, you know, if she drops it or something, because like I said, we didn't get to see the sword in action. But the fact that it was bonded to her in that way made it kind of go pretty high on my list of swords. And that is why it made it onto this list. And then the very final sword that I want to talk about, sword number five, is full of spoiler alerts. So if you have not read The Sword of Shannara and you plan on reading The Sword of Shannara, I would go ahead and say, go ahead and end the video right now and I will see you guys later. But if you want to know about The Sword of Shannara, then go ahead and stick around for the next minute or so. The Sword of Shannara, the entire book, uh, they are on a quest to try and find this sword because the sword is the only thing that can stop the super evil dude that is trying to take over the world. And that is the sword that is shown right here. Uh, it is an absolutely gorgeous so sword right there by the hilt, uh, just as in this picture, uh, both on the hilt and on the stand. Uh, it shows a hand holding a torch, and you can't really tell, but it's actually right there in the middle of the sword as well. The sword does glow uh, when Shea Omsford Shea uh, picks it up. Uh, the sword has a very special ability that you do not find out about until the very, very end of the book when everything is going down. Which is why I said if you haven't read it and you plan to and you don't want spoilers, don't continue watching. So the Sword of Shannara, uh, they know that it has magical abilities. They know that it's the only thing that can defeat this great evil. It turns out that the magical abilities is truth. The sword forces whoever is holding it, or even whoever comes in contact with it, if it's stabbed into them, to have to face the truth of who they truly are. Like, all of the truth. No, like, no illusions of who they think they are, no um, memories that they've built up in their mind. It completely bears their soul and shows them exactly who they are. And so when Shay Onsford holds it and it shows all this stuff, he didn't know this was going to happen. And so he was completely unprepared, but he is able to admit to himself and to see that part of himself that he doesn't like, that is scary, like a scaredy cat and selfish. And he's able to embrace that that is only a small part of himself. And so he's able to survive. Another character who I think he was like a goblin or something, was not able to uh, admit the parts of himself that he didn't like, and uh, he died. And the same with the great evil that they had to battle. Uh, when he is stabbed with the sword, he uh, is not able to accept who he really is, and he realizes that the image that he's had of himself ceased to exist thousands of years before, and so he too dies. And so that is the power of the sword. Um, yes, it is a very great, finely made work of art. It is an incredibly well-made sword. Uh, it functions as an incredibly well-made sword, but it also has the secret ability where it makes you face the truth of who you are. 
And honestly, I don't know if I could handle that. I don't think I would want to see the parts of myself that I'm not proud of and to have to face them without anything to protect me. Just me and me. <sighs> that would be a hard thing to do. I, I really like that. And I love that one so much because it is something that, like, it's an ability that I feel like I don't hear about too much in swords. Then again, I don't read a lot of high fantasy, so maybe there are other swords out there that are like that. But I really like that one. Anyway, those are five of my favorite swords. I'm really looking forward to the next video where I get to talk about more of my favorite swords, including Brissinger and some cool swords from that Nicholas St. North book. So I will see you guys next time. Bye.